So hi, everybody. I hope you are all doing great. Um, welcome to the third fish uh, of the spring term. Uh, today, we are delighted to have uh, Rami Namur from uh, Total. Uh, Rami graduated in 2000, uh, 2011 with a PhD in computational and applied mathematics from uh, Rice University. And he has since been working for Total Research and Technology. Um, his research interests include uh, inverse problems and uncertainty quantification, uh, dealing with uh, various applications uh, from seismic imaging, CO2 sequestration, and leak detection for health, safety, and environment. Today, we'll talk about uh, two methods to deal with uh, the non convexity of the seismic inverse problem. So, please, Rami, you can uh, share your screen and, and take it away. Well, uh... Thank you, Andrea and Zilon, for the invitation and, and the introduction. And uh, I would like to thank everyone for attending the talk. Andrea, if you could just signal if you can see the, the slides OK. Yes, we can see them. OK. So uh, as Adrian said, then the last 10 years or so, I've occupied Two, position, two positions, one as a research geophysicist dealing with classical seismic inverse problems and the other one as uh, leading a project on inverse problems and uncertainty quantification or get to deal with newer uh, applications. I couldn't decide on what to speak about for today. So I actually chose one from, from each world. They both deal with the same uh, problem of the con non-convexity of the seismic inverse problem. Uh, the first one is, oh. I will start by introducing the full waveform inversion as a formulation of the inverse problem for the wave equation, the seismic inverse problem, and introduce its limitations. And then uh, introduce the proposed uh, method, nonlinear inversion velocity analysis, or NEVA for short, or by uh, introducing an extent, extension concept as a reformulation of the inverse problem and show some examples. Everyone knows the, the wave equation. It's, it's here, it's sitting there very pretty. This is the wave operator on the pressure field is equal to the right-hand side. These are normally acoustic uh, pressure field. Normally modeled as delta functions in space with some time dependence, but you don't have to. It's abstraction, and the abstraction here is for the sake of possible generalizations to other wave equations is R on S, the forward model on F. So S maps the right-hand side to the solution, and R restricts the pressure uh, at the, to the receivers or to the acquisition uh, manifold, if you want. I'm not uh, carrying all this notation with me to be obtuse, just all this notation will come to play a role in, the, in this presentation, the source and the receiver restriction. So the model says, given an M and an F, I can produce data. This is the model that I will be dealing with as a toy model, low velocity lens with a reflector under it. This is the source wavelet, the time dependence of it. This is a band limited delta function. And the space dependence is just a delta function. In this case, I'm showing two, receive, two sources at the X positions, source one and source two. And the receivers are all along uh, the surface here. And off we go with the wave equation. This is the, the modeling code. You could see the, the waves bouncing. And every time this, uh, these receivers are flickering, it is because they are seeing pressure variations. You see the reflections from here. You see, for example, the transmission through the low velocity, and you get data that looks like this. This is the direct wave going from sources to receivers. Everybody is normally familiar with this. This is the transmitted wave. You can see that it's gone through a low velocity zone because this part of it is retarded. This is a bit more because this source was just on top of the lens you can see that the wavefront is retarded. And faintly here, you could see the reflections. Full waveform, the, the inverse problem of for uh, reflection seismology, if you want, or the seismic inverse problem is, find the model M 
that fits the data for all the shots. Full waveform inversion or what full waveform inversion has come to mean is nothing but the output least squares formulation of the inverse problem. So you choose the L2 norm on the data and you, uh, you formulate the inverse problem as an optimization problem. And we refer to this as full waveform inversion, but it's really the most straightforward formulation of the inverse problem. We need some prior knowledge. We, I will start with the background model missing the lens and the reflector. And I run the optimization with, low, with gradient, uh, in this case, LBFGS, for example. And I obtain a model that has nothing to do with the reality. If I include even the faintest hint of the lens, not the full strength of the lens, these two models, you can barely see the difference between one starting model and the other. Suddenly the result is completely different. You get convergence to a model that is that looks quite like the, the, the correct model. The gradients do hold some hint of this happening, but, and you see that in one case, most of the gradient is pointing in the wrong direction of the lens and the, in another case, uh, most of the gradient is pointing in the, wrong, in the correct direction. So blue is bad here and red is good. Uh, I changed conventions on you. Uh, and if, but this measure, of course, is not available to us in reality because this requires the access to the real model. Looking at the data uh, residual differences, you can barely really see any difference between one and the other. You'd be hard pressed to read on the data uh, error whether you were gonna get uh, success or, or failure. But in general, this is a nonlinear problem in very high dimension. Multiple minima are the rule, not the exception really. We do now understand from numerical experiments and there are some theoretical uh, results that point to the spectral incompleteness. The, the lack of high frequency makes you lose uh, resolution but more severely, it appears that the lack of low frequency is what leads to this, uh, to these multiple minima uh, that are normally in different and wildly different places. But also we know that limited coverage is a problem. Uh, in, in medical imaging, we get to surround the patient with sources and receivers in some cases, and we obtain much better uh, results. And this is because of the ability to choose the position of the sources and receivers. The, the folklore refers to all of these problems as cycle skipping. There is some ways to, uh, to make this exact with some theorems, but I won't go there really. But in general, you say that uh, full waveform inversion succeeds if the starting model is close to the real model and, and does not succeed otherwise. Close is a notion that depends on the frequencies that you have and on the data and model complexity and the co coverage itself. The extension concept is a complete, uh, it looks like a complete, uh, something that has nothing to do with the formulation of the inverse problem. In fact, you end up adding non-physical dimensions to the model you fit the data at any model, including the wrong ones, and then you've penalized these non-physical dimensions to get the correct model. The closest concept that you've seen in math is, for example, infeasible point methods for, for optimization, where you break the, the, uh, the constraints of the problem, you solve maybe a non-constrained problem that is easier to solve, and then you enforce the constraints. The, uh, the important thing is that if the solution, if you are to succeed at solving the, the relaxed problem, the solution is the same as the constraint problem. For the seismic inverse problem, people have been doing this all along under different names called migration velocity analysis. What they used to do is they produce image gathers either per shot or per offset. 
they produce these image gathers independently. So it's as if each shot sees a different earth and then they would adjust the velocity so that all the shots see the same earth. So in fact, they were always doing that, but they've never formulated it uh, as a mathematical uh, optimization problem. And all the work that came after with the work of science and the extension uh, literature is just the mathematical formulation of these things and analysis done on them. The limitation of MVA is that you can formulate it as a linearized inversion, so it cannot fit all physics, it cannot, for example, fit multiples and other things. The method that I'm proposing in this talk is fully nonlinear. It adds, it relaxes the, the fact that the model is the same for all the shots and adds a model perturbation delta ms to each model. However, I'm not linearizing. I am leaving the dependence completely nonlinear. And I define delta ms as the minimizer that fits the data. So I get one, a different model for each shot. And the objective function that tries to get the model is the one that, that annihilates all these model perturbations. It is fully nonlinear, incorporates any physics that the original problem had, and but it is relaxed. To, I will note that this is quite a, a complex function. You've defined your objective function in terms of the solution of a nonlinear optimization problem. I just spent the first half of the talk dissing full waveform inversion. And I just told you that I want to reformulate full waveform inversion, almost the same formulation, but per shot. Of course, this formulation still has the same limitations as the original problem. We still lack low frequencies. And in fact, coverage is a lot worse in this case because we're only dealing with one source. The proposed solution is to create fictitious low frequencies from the starting model or the model at each iteration by picking a low frequency source and generating that fictitious data and creating fictitious full coverage data by again using the full source with low and high frequencies and adding receivers on the sides and on the bottom. This work the extension concept has been developed heavily in the literature and there is variations of all these things. The closest work to, to this work is uh, the thesis of Dong, uh, Dong Sung uh, in 2010 and then the thesis of uh, Igor Terentiev where they introduced the concept of complementary low frequency information as control and they introduced the plane wave domain to deal a bit with the data coverage. Uh, as far as I know, the, uh, the introduction of the full coverage as, as fictitious controlled data is, is novel in this approach. So this, these are the, the low frequency source that I add to the source and it only complements the spectrum. So it creates almost a, delta a band limited delta function up to zero Hertz. This model I'll be using for all the subsequent experiments. And as you see, as I said, we have the real receivers on the top, but I add fictitious receivers on the bottom and on the sides. This is what fictitious data looks like. Normally, we only acquire data at the surface that I showed you. This is the full coverage data. This would be data from the top, data from the bottom, the left, and the right, because this source happens to be closest, closer to the left side. And you can see the low frequency information from, this is the normal data, and you can see the low frequency information as blue sheens and red sheens, for example, on the data, especially prevalent in the transmission data for, for, for theoretical reasons. And here is the inversion. Here is a, a numerical proof that what I told you is correct, that 
adding low frequency data and full coverage data completely conditions the problem. This is the inversion result with only one shot with full coverage, and you see that you can get almost the full model. This is crucial because the objective function formulation requires you to solve an inverse problem. If the solution is not unique, the minimizer is not unique, it means that starting from slightly different initial models can lead to completely different solutions that objective function would not even be continuous, let alone differentiable. So the uniqueness of the minimizer is crucial. I'm sure that there is a theorem about the uniqueness in this case for smooth media, but there, there, is, no such there is no such result for discontinuous media, which is what I'm interested in because I want reflections. This is the objective function in all its glory. It is awful. It looks, it, it looks bad. I add the low frequency data, the, the, the extra so, uh, receivers everywhere, and I formulate it as such, and I penalize the, the model perturbations. I will not dwell too much on this. What I will say is this, that does have a computable gradient with an adjoint state method and a version of the implicit, implicit function theorem. I'm not, it is, I would not even dare present these things for lunch hour. These things tend to be disgusting calculations. It is simplified by the variable projection method. And I chose the objective function that way to simplify these derivations and to make it affordable. One thing I will note is that the fictitious data, whether the low frequency data or the full coverage data is a catalyst it gets in at the beginning of the optimization. And if the optimization succeeds, all the fictitious data drops out. Why does it drop out? The, if delta ms, if all the perturbations are zero, which should only happen near the true solution, and this you have to either assume or we assume it's correct because we, we think that it is correct that the minimizer is unique. So if the solution is unique and the solution is M star, then delta MS are zero only around the solution. The low frequency data that I added equals the low frequency data, the synthetic data that I'm producing and it drops out. And the full coverage data that I added equals the full coverage data uh, the synthetic full coverage data that, I, that I'm adding, and that drops out of the equation, and the objective function converges to that of full wave, full wave form inversion. So this fictitious data only acts as a regularizer to the objective function. At the beginning of the inversion, we invert model for shot five, for example, and shot 26. They look nothing like each other, but the important fact is that they both fit, to the, fit the data to uh, a very good, uh, you know, to a few percent uh, error or, or even less than that, sometimes less than 1% error. The gradient, however, now is completely different than that of full waveform inversion, and it points mostly to the right direction. Again, this measure is not available to us in reality because we have no access to the real model, but it gives you a hint that it's a completely different uh, way of, of addressing the problem. Your QC, or the equivalent of flattening the gathers for, for, way for, for uh, migration velocity analysis, for example, is whether these perturbations are decreasing as a function of iteration. And you see that we are able to decrease the L2 norm, the energy in these uh, perturbations by two orders of magnitude through the iteration. Of course, these are nonlinear iterations. Remember, each one of these iterations is solving a nonlinear optimization problem inside of it, which takes maybe 50 to 100 uh, wave solves. So this is all pretty expensive stuff. And apparently, I was very really excited about producing uh, producing videos. And 
I'm showing you a video of the evolution of the M, which is the control model for the outer problem. While at the beginning, the two models were widely different, you see that at the end of the optimization, the models converge for each shot to models that are quite close to each other. And of course, that's another way of seeing that delta ms is converging to zero for every s. If we start full waveform inversion for some refinement from the, the, the NEVA solution, because this is quite expensive, uh, and then the full waveform inversion is equivalent to one NEVA iteration, if you want, we get a much more refined uh, solution. Of course, this, this example is simple. That's not what we spend our lives doing. Uh, I did produce this for a more difficult salt model example. This is the HES model. The salt was surgically removed and put over a, a reflector. Full waveform inversion, if you do it for the lower band of the frequencies, and by low band here, I mean anything about four or five hertz, I, uh, which is what we normally acquire. And you push it to the high frequencies, you see that the solution is completely, uh, is quite awful. Of course, it's not gonna be bad in, in areas that are simple, but it's gonna be bad in areas that are dominated by the complex salt. The QC that you have to do to see if, if this has any way of succeeding is trying to invert with one shot with the full coverage, low frequency and, uh, and, low, uh, and, and low frequency and full coverage data. In this case, I do it for the true model, but if you don't, you, you construct your best estimate of, you put some, some salt that, is, that looks like it and you, you make up a model and you do the inversion. Because if that doesn't succeed, you don't try this approach, the NEVA approach, because it will lead to a function that is discontinuous and it's not gonna be very good for optimization. You see that this is not perfect, but it does do a much better job than FWI does with full coverage and low, low frequencies. So I ran a few iteration, by a few I mean hundreds of iterations and every now and then I would check on what FWI would yield starting from that. So the evolution was quite slow. This is the, the model in non-dynamic color range. So you see it's barely faint. So it, it's going on, but it's very slow. So this problem is quite ill conditioned. In dynamic range, you do see that it's creating something. But if you start FWI from that model, you do see that the model that you converge to is much, much better. While this is very promising, and this example is quite difficult. I mean, I, did, I don't really have a lot of data. The fact that you only have one uh, reflector under here is limiting quite a bit the data that comes back. This is not what happens in reality but this is also a synthetic. So I may as well make it difficult so it can at least resemble some reality. But this was the orders of thousands of full waveform iterations. So I'm not sure that this is ready for production yet where we cannot even convince people to do Hessians because they think that they're too expensive. To summarize, for waveform inversion suffers from local minima, so it's sensitive to the start model. The extension concept introduces non-physical dimensions and fits the data at any model, then penalizes these non-physical dimensions to get to the solution of the full waveform inversion problem along a completely different optimization path. In some cases, we can prove that that optimization problem is much more smooth than the, uh, and does not have local minima, unlike for waveform inversion, for example. In this talk, I've introduced nonlinear inversion velocity analysis, which is a nonlinear example that relaxes the, uh, the fact that the earth is unique for all the shots, wherever you look at it from. It fits all relevant physics, multiples, transmission, reflection, whatever you want. The numerical example show that it is more robust than full waveform inversion. However, it could be very expensive. So it could be in orders of hundreds to thousands iterations of full waveform inversion, and therefore is not completely ready for production yet. 
So this concludes the first part. And I propose that we that I take questions for about five minutes about uh, this first part because the second part is somewhat independent and it would be a bit difficult to come back. Great, thanks. So if everybody has, a, if anyone has a question for Rami, just unmute on the first part of his talk. Hello, Rami, I have a question. Of course. So I see you uh, introduced uh, a, a low frequency source, uh, artificial low frequency source in your framework, right? Mm -hmm. Do you need to open up, optimize over that too? Uh, so in this case, because I am, in this case, because I am producing that source, so I have access to it, I don't optimize over it. Uh, you can, in fact, optimize over it. And supposedly that I've, I have uh, analyzed that, that formulation. And uh -huh. in some cases, believe it or not, for full waveform inversion, it is better for you to, to invert for the source, even if you know it. Because mm -hmm. it is, again, an, an extension concept. Because you're not assuming that all the sources are unique. So it mm -hmm. does, in a way, uh, regularize the inverse problem. And I played with that, but in this case, I, I didn't bother because I did have access to it. And uh, for you, sorry, uh, I do did need to preserve this uh, this property as much as I can, which is the fact that the 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 fictitious data that I'm creating is supposed to drop out at the end. Okay. So if if you don't uh, input the source yourself. You, you also need to prove that the source is unique, which is not very difficult because, you know, this is a linear, the, the source inversion is a linear problem. So it's much easier to prove uniqueness in that case. And at the, as you get close to the correct model and it will still drop up. Mm -hmm. And another question that you mentioned that for a nonlinear velocity analysis, you. You, you will have one model for one shot. Do you mean that for each shot, you will do a completely inversion? Yes, you do a complete independent inversion, but each one shot has a lot more receivers. So it has full coverage. So it's almost like medical imaging if you want. So each okay. one shot is, this inversion was done with only one shot and it gives you the whole model because of the full coverage and the low frequencies. So each one shot behaves almost like a full uh, full seismic acquisition. So you have receiver at, at all around the, the, the model? Yes. I put receivers all... around the model. In the same way I introduce the, 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 low, the low frequency data, I add the low frequency data, I uh -huh. add full full coverage data, and both of them will drop out at the end of the optimization. Okay. So the full coverage of data is just in, the, in your optimization or it's already in your setting of the problem? It's, I, I synthesize it in my optimization. It, the, you don't have it from the field data. Okay. You don't, you won't have it and you don't assume that you have it. It only mm -hmm. regularizes these sub problems for each shot and makes them solvable each shot by itself. And then at the wow. end, so the, the thing is there is this nonlinear interplay. If you have full coverage yes. and full frequencies, you don't need the model to be close. Yes. If you have a model that is close, you don't need either the full frequencies or the full coverage. Yeah. So what you do is at the beginning when the model is not close, I add the full coverage data and the low frequencies data to regularize the solution of the inverse problem. And all these things are created synthetically, fictitiously. I don't assume that I have them from the field. And at the end, I made the objective function in a way that they would completely drop out at that point, the model itself is close to the true model and you don't need them anymore. And in fact, they, they are supposed to drop out and you only rely on your true uh, field data. Okay. 
Thank you. Maybe we can take one more question before continuing. Uh, Philip speaking. Uh, Rami, you mentioned that uh, for your analysis, nonlinear inverse analysis, you need uh, roughly 100 to 1,000 iteration of uh, FWER. Uh, is it possible to, how is scalable? Is it possible to maintain some scalability in this iteration or not? I, I know the reason why I chose this extension in particular is because I know how to precondition it. And I did not introduce any of that here. I just maintain everything in the vanilla, you know, uh, formulation to see what it does without any interference. We can, I think some, uh, some preconditioning will scale would make this almost doable. But uh, as I said before, it is hard for us to convince people to do normal preconditioning with Hessians, for example, because they think it's too expensive in an uh, in operational uh, environment, let alone introducing a really complex <laughs> objective function that, uh, and, and a really complex gradient and then doing preconditioning on that. I have not done any of that. Uh, that remains an avenue for investigation whether preconditioning can bring the cost of this down. Okay, thanks. Great. Uh, I, I propose that maybe we, we continue with the second part and we can uh, come back with questions on that part uh, at the very end as well. Of course. And now for change of gears uh, from my new position and I will be talking about the generative modeling for, for inverse problems. Uh, my interest in, in machine learning has really been through the window of, of inverse problems and inverse problems alone. The outline uh, of this talk is an introduction to large scale inverse problems, which I'm sure everybody here knows about, and a gentle introduction to generative modeling. In two particular kinds of it, the GANs and variational autoencoders I will investigate in this talk. I will then discuss the quality of the learned representation through generative modeling and its ability to simplify the, the inverse problem. First, for the uninitiated, in, inverse problems arise when you cannot measure a quantity directly. I mean, if you want to measure your weight, you jump on a scale and you, you have a reading of that, that you don't require an inverse problem for that. But if you want to recover the velocity in the subsurface and you don't want to dig every time you want it, you have to measure data that is somewhat related to it. For example, the solution of the wave equation when you send acoustic uh, energy into the subsurface. You measure data, the forward problem is related to the data through some physical model and the inverse problem asks and tries to answer the question, what does the data tell me about the model or the quantity of interest? It's ab abstraction is very easy. The forward map is a map between a model space and a data space. Uh, you can get uh, some some good properties out of assuming that these are Hilbert spaces and introducing constraints and things. I will keep this very general for the for this talk. And the inverse problem in its more in its most general uh, formulation is find m such that f of m approximately equal to d. Of course, this doesn't say anything. I did not say what approximately equal means. And the whole essence of inverse problems is trying to come up with model norms and data norms on these spaces where you get solutions that are easy, tractable, and meaningful. And that becomes the whole field of inverse problems. I'm not going to go into that. But I will say that the inverse problems that we are interested in are large scale in both the model domain and in the data domain. They're, they belong, let's say, in Rn with n much, much bigger than one. For seismic data, for example, the, the model is of the size 10 to the 9 in 3D and the data is of the size 10 to the 12 in, in, in 3D. Even worse, the cost of applying, so the, even the cost of sometimes uh, 
writing and storing the data, for example, is huge. And we do that with parallel I.O. and we must be very uh, frugal in the number of reading and writing of data that we do. The cost of applying F, which in this case could be solving the wave equation or some variation of the wave equation that's very expensive is again uh, quite, uh, is quite expensive and must be limited. So this leads to practical limitations for solving the inverse problem. We have to think about HPC and because we cannot do, uh, we cannot apply the, object, the, the forward model too many times, we are almost relegated to only local optimization problems, gradient based. And even then we can only take a few iterations of these. Global optimization is normally not viable, even when we know that the problem is not convex, like for waveform inversion. It's not that people don't know that it's not convex, it's just that you cannot afford for these number of dimensions to do global optimization. What about, what does machine learning, what can machine learning bring to, to inverse problems? The, the physics of, of F, the wave equation or the heat equation or whatever equation you have is normally well understood. I see a lot of people trying to just completely replace the forward model with machine learning. And in my humble opinion, that's just vain. You understand F, why do you need to replace it? Why do you need to learn it again? And in fact, because of the amount of data required to, to learn F is normally prohibitive. And it's even synthetically, it is very hard to, to apply F. In our case, we don't require, we don't acquire nearly enough data for that. But machine learning can still help when you know that the model of the data have, or the data have structure. So they have certain statistics, we have bounds. We don't really have a good language to talk about these things. People will tell you this is a geologic physics uh, model and this is not geological. This looks like data. I showed you data earlier. You saw hyperbola, you saw a structure to the data. You see it, but you don't know how to express it explicitly. Mathematically, you say that the model or the data live on a lower dimensional manifold embedded in our N with a very large N. But we don't know how to parameterize this manifold explicitly. And again, in my humble opinion, these are the avenues where machine learning can help. When you have a relationship, you know you have an, a simple relationship, but you don't know how to express it explicitly. You, ex you learn it and you express it explicitly in a way through machine learning. So this is the Marmousi model. We see structure in it. We see that the, on a 100 by 500 pixel patch, I could have drawn a face. I could have drawn a number from the MNIST data set but the velocity model looks like neither. So it must, so it doesn't require all these degrees of freedom to be expressed, except I have no way of expressing that structure explicitly. The structure is implicit. One case where I have a structure that is explicit is for layered media. 1D layered media presented as 2D models. In this case, I can specify the layer thicknesses and the value of the velocity in these thicknesses. Let's say with 10 layers, I choose 10 numbers and, and 10 velocities. I know that one should be nine and the other one should be 10, but I'm not gonna bother. And the size, and with 22 numbers, I have an explicit representation of the lower dimensional manifold that is sitting on a 64 by 128 grid. So this is the one case that at least I know of where I do have an explicit representation of the structure, of the statistical structure. Why do I need it? It is the only example that I can think of where I can in fact compare whether a learned representation performs as well as an explicit representation so that I can have some faith that when I learn these representations that are implicit, that what I'm doing is going to be correct. In this case, the, pro the inverse problem is still of decent size and layered media are a decent approximation to geology in some parts of this world, like Saudi Arabia, where the, where the geology is simple layered. It, the inverse problem in this case is better understood than the general case that I discussed first, 
it is simple in some ways because of the 1D structure, but it is, the physics can be more challenging and there are some obstructions to getting uh, a solution because of multiples and having no transmission. And there are even some theoretical issues with it in 1D, but this is 2D data uh, of, of 1D media. Generative law modeling tries to learn an implicit representation of the manifold with a latent variable that has very low dimensions. In this talk, it will be between three and 10. I'll be seeing three and 10. This talk would concentrate on generating models. So M approximately equal to generator of Z. I will not discuss generating data. Generating models would allow me to, with, with very low degrees of freedom, will allow me to uh, investigate global optimization problems. Generating data with low degrees of freedom will allow you to, for example, investigate exotic metrics uh, that are somewhat too, too expensive to calculate at high degrees of freedom. But the real question is, does that simplify the inverse problem? And we will, we will see later. GANs, which are, probably everybody's favorite now. They train a generator and discriminator in a game. The generator produces models and the discriminator tries to score whether these models are real and fake. If trained correctly, the generator can fool the discriminator. So I do train both, and this is just a gentle introduction. I'm sure that most of you are more familiar with games than I am. And I train both, and for the rest of this, I only use the generator because that's what I need. I invest, I'm gonna investigate dense, fully dense uh, GANs and deep convolutional GANs. The, the, the general consensus is that these are hard to train and I saw that, but they produce sharp results. GAN, I did train a network of GANs, fully dense GANs with uh, latent parameter number three and I obtained results, but I saw that it was a bit, uh, you know, a bit noisy. I know that my training was not perfect, but I didn't really care because, and, and for deep convolutional GANs, you get much better results. They look a lot more like the statistics of the model we started with. I, I didn't really care because uh, the, I could use total variation, for example, on the, on the result that I produce to regularize it and get rid of that low noise. And I know that it's not going to affect my, my problem too much. So I didn't put too much uh, effort into the learning procedure. Variational autoencoders train an, enc an encoder, which limits the, the, the degrees of freedom from model to the latent space, and a decoder in a way that has an approximate left invertibility, such that D on E of M is approximately equal to M, which gives it some better theoretical uh, properties, I'm sure, uh, because of the invertibility property. But then that invertibility is quite approximate in reality. The variational part forces Z to follow a normal distribution, so it becomes a much better way to, uh, so it becomes a generator of, uh, of results. So D, the decoder becomes the generator after training and the encoder, uh, I will use it in some cases uh, if needed. The consensus is that they're easier to train, but what you obtain are much, uh, are, are much uh, simpler, much smoother models. And again, if you were insistent on marking these models a bit more non-smooth, you could use TV to sharpen these results. I will pose three qualitative questions and try to answer them. First one, first one is how good is the generator? Can it generate all these models in this world? And the second one is, are the generated, even if it doesn't produce models that are too close, are the generated models sufficient for the purposes of the inverse problem? And I will make these a bit more uh, exact. And the third question is, does the sparse reformulation simplify the solution of the inverse problem? So for the first one, 
you can formulate it quantitatively by trying to in, to uh, to evaluate z that minimizes generator of z minus n, and then see if that is in fact close to the real model. Uh, my notion of success is if the model error is less than 10%, I will call it success in L2. And here is the result. You see that the explicit representation succeeds in more than 90% of the time. The implicit representations toil between 4 and 16%. And so the criterion that I put may be too straight. And it says that it doesn't really succeed. I will talk about more about this. But in reality, I have no way of doing better. At the end of the day, this is the only way I can access Z is by running the optimization. In this case, it is global optimization because this is a small scale optimization problem. And these are the models that are recovered, for example, for GAN. This, these are all failures. I show a success here for example, two successes and so on and so forth. And the nice thing is that with the variational autoencoders, the left invertibility results used by the encoder almost produce the same result as the optimization, which so at least that makes sense. The quantitative version of, of question two is, given the answer for question one, the closest model, if I start full waveform inversion from that solution, from M that is generated by G of Z star, is that enough to solve full waveform inversion? Again, in the model domain, I said success is less than 10% relative error. In the data domain, I will call success uh, less than 2% in data error. Note that this cannot be done in operations because I'm using the true model as my QC. So uh, question one and question two, I'm answering in a way that is not operationally uh, uh, correct. Questions three is gonna get a bit better. I also want to note that the HPC limitations of this, the cost of applying the generator on GPU is much less than CPU, much less than TV, much less than applying the forward model on CPU. To give you a scale, the GPU uh, application of the generator is, is less than a millisecond. On CPU, it's an order of a millisecond. The TV regularization is about 70 milliseconds, but the forward model takes 20 seconds for a function and gradient. And it's only CPU multi-threaded. These are my own codes. So these experiments can take 30 to five hours, uh, 30 minutes to five hours. And I'm doing 120 of these experiments because the problem is very difficult to solve. So you can only say something statistically. So you need to solve it many times. Just a note. So these are the inversion results from starting for GAN3. And you see, uh, these are saying, this is a success, for example. This was a recovery success for the model and it's a recovery success from the data. This is one case where the recovery, the model, I call it a failure, but then full waveform inversion corrects it, which is a hint that my model uh, criterion was a bit too strict, but it doesn't matter. You have to draw the line somewhere. And the results say that the, the model the model and data error improved considerably. So the success rate nearly doubled for each case, which really says that my first criterion was too straight. The success rate for GAN with three parameters with TV is more, more than 30%. So mainly the, the, question, the results from Q1 were a bit too pessimistic in reality. What you should see is that the jump in the success rate between the triangle and the box, and this is in each case, they almost doubled. The quantitative version of question three starts by solving the global optimization problem for Z because it's small scale, you can do that and then runs for waveform inversion after. This in fact defines an oper operational workflow. I'm not using the true model in this case at all other than evaluating the success. And 
there is no cheating in solving this, uh, this question three. And again, we see that TVGAN3 has some good results. This is a recovery failure that FWI, for example, corrects. This is another success. And this, this uh, slide almost summarizes the whole talk. DC GAN and, and the variational encoders were not very good results. And there are reasons behind that because I did not constrain uh, the parameters as well as I should have. I, I need to go back to that. But the encouraging result, and I, I will uh, let you concentrate on the boxes, which are the success rate. This is the explicit representation that we have with, with thicknesses and, and values of order uh, that makes it 20 parameters has almost the same success rate as the learned representation from generative modeling. And DVGAN has about 10, both have about 10% uh, success rate. This is still a difficult problem, as I said, even in the case of the explicit representation, the success rate is no more than 10%. But in either case, it is double the success rate of starting with no prior. So I could have started all these uh, optimizations with a homogeneous medium of, this, of starting from the first layer. And you see that the failure, uh, in most cases, you get failure. You do still go, do get success. But of course, you need that as your uh, control group. Because if they're doing as well as starting from a homogeneous model, why should I bother? And you see that the success rate is almost double by by any uh, by any measure so to conclude implicit structure can be learned with enough data how do i get enough data to learn structure of velocity models that are implicit i still don't have an answer to that whether we have enough uh, real models and constructed models and synthetics to do that regularization is still going to be inverse problem dependent but these learned sparse representations perform favorably with respect to explicit representations when they exist. And they allow us to do things like global optimization that we were not able to do before. For this study, as I said, the solution depends on the model. And this is part of the, the nonlinearity. So I had to do a statistical, uh, a statistical study and I had to do 120 experiments for this to be representative. I note the general GPU, CPU, HPC issues. And more importantly, you need a lot of fault tolerance because sometimes the machine learning results will spit out things that don't make any sense physically, negative, uh, negative velocities or velo velocities out of bound that your modeling code is not gonna really like at all. In this case, I used a form of uh, a fault tolerance, which would try to resubmit it with a different model. So I do have ways of, of doing that, and I did that. But in general, we need to think about this uh, carefully. And the best way is to try to constrain the bounds of Z, for example, and the output, so that we can control these with optimization, with constrained optimization uh, a bit better, which I did not do well for DCGAN and VAE, but I did do uh, for, for GANs, for example, I was quite careful with that for the fully connected GANs. So with that, I conclude and I'm ready to take any questions. Great, thank you very much for the second part. Um, it was indeed quite different from, from the first part. Um, again, if you have any question, uh, just unmute yourself and uh, feel free to, to ask Rami. Hi. Hi. Um, that, that I was only able to join what I believe is part two of the talk. I definitely didn't see a part one, but I think I joined right at the moment when part two started. So thanks a lot. It's, it's really cool. It's good, good to see those experiments. Um, philosophically, if you go back to what your advisor did 30 years ago, <laughs> Um, how, uh, that's Bill Symes. Uh, well, how do you, how do you um, uh, see this in the context of all these other algorithms that have been proposed for dealing with the non-convexity issue in, uh, in FWI? And uh, can you comment more broadly on the, on the context and the role that these ideas might play uh, later? I, I've, I've thought about that and I don't 
I mean, they're completely different or ortho almost orthogonal attacks uh, to, to the problem. My, this was really just a completely numerical experiment because we almost have no theoretical proof that making the number of degrees of freedom less, for example, really simplifies the problem. You know that we could, you could make the topography of that objective function, you could pack the topography in, in lower dimensions to be really even more uh, complex than the topography of the original one, and you still would not have simplified anything. And global optimization is a no, no panacea. I mean, at the end of the day, you could always create a model where you have to visit each cell before, before you get a, a good global solution. This was nothing but uh, a, a numerical implementation. And the only really encouraging result is that if you had an explicit representation, the, impl the implicitly learned representation would perform equally well. Uh, at the end of the day, even this problem is, is difficult. Uh, even if you had the explicit representation, it is difficult. I think that the other set of ideas are better suited for the wave equation problem because you end up proving in ways, uh, and that was the first part of my talk. That was the extension, uh, the extension part. You end up proving Sorry. <laughs> the function does not, uh, and I didn't prove it here, and I couldn't prove it for for my formulation thereof. But in some cases, uh, where there is theoretical proof that one. FWI will suffer a local minimum of the order of uh, within lambda away, uh, and, and lambda being the smallest, you know, uh, the smallest lambda, sorry, the biggest lambda, or whatever it is, that, that, that the basin of attraction will scale with, with, the, with the lambda that you have in your data. And you can prove in some of these extensions that they don't suffer that problem. Some of the extensions, you can also prove that they suffer the exact same limitation as full waveform inversion. In fact, it turns out that it's not the fitting the data that is important. What is important is preserving the structure that Stoke and Symes talk about in 2003, where the objective function can be formulated as the inner product of oscillatory something so the differential operator and oscillatory something. And they prove that that objective function is, is smooth. And if you cannot have your objective function formulated in a way that is that, uh, these objective functions are not, are not smooth. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is these ad hoc methodologies, what do they bring to these other objective functions? I mean, if you know that it is uh, smooth, but you can make the degrees of freedom much less. I have not really uh, investigated uh, these things. This is very ad hoc, but I see a lot of people doing GANs and, and starting to use them. I mean, they, in our case, we don't care for faces and numbers and MS data sets. We have to have them generate models. But again, the question is, just the fact that it generates models with less degrees of freedom doesn't mean that it has simplified the inverse problem. In this case, at least it has simplified it as well as having an explicit representation. Now, how do I get enough data to learn from uh, models 2D or 3D where I don't have this explicit representation remains a completely unsolved uh, problem for me. Right. I, I also wanted to plug uh, the work of my postdoc, Jilong Fang, who worked on, on, uh, on GAN as well. And, and the, um, the idea is that uh, you could use that to formulate the prior itself, so to replace TV essentially. And you can ask the question, um, how, how applicable is it to the question of formulating a prior completely without any extra physical information, just from training of, you know, uh, you, you mentioned uh, layered media or layered light media. You, you, could, you could throw in like a, an enormous set, see how GAN reacts to that. So I kind of invite you to take a look at what we wrote. And in fact, this, there are other groups that have been working on this. Um, this is a paper by Moser and a paper by in the group of Felix Herman, I think over the past few years. You might, you might want to take a look. You probably already know about all of this. Hey, may I see if your uh, hand raised? Hi, Nami. Um, very 
interesting pair of uh, presentations. Thank you. Um, in the training of the encoder, maybe you explained this and I'm sorry if I missed it, but are you training just on the structure of the models or is there sort of a, a use of the forward operator so that the models, that the actual behavior of the models is part of the training? The no, the structure of the model to learn how to generate layered media with, with less degrees of freedom in a way. This is, this is my proxy for trying to generate real velocity model. The problem, the problem that I have is that I have no way of generating enough models like Marmousi to train an encoder or a GAN to produce these models. But I do have a way of generating as many of layered media as I want. Right. Not because I have an explicit way of representing those in terms of layer uh, thicknesses and values of velocities inside the thickness. But now from a, from a physical point of view, these models still behave like 2D models sitting on a much, uh, on a much finer grid. So the physics has not been simplified in any way. I just have a back door to produce models that uh, that the VAE or the GANs can, can learn from. And just to follow up, um, when we speak of the lower dimensional manifold in which the encoding lives, should we think of that kind of rigorously that the manifold has some structure or is it just a way of speaking of a smaller set? So uh, I don't know and probably Laurent would know better if there is any good rigorous results about it. What they normally do is for example, uh, what when they do faces, when they show you uh, reserve faces results, they start from one face and another and traverse it along the line, um, right? Along the line uh, relating the first one to the second one. They show you that look, it's still producing faces. What are they trying to do? They're trying to they and most of these people don't don't are not very familiar with that other language, but this is really you're trying to prove that. Uh, that these functions are continuous or smooth along convex uh, uh, on convex sets. Yeah, exactly what you're trying to see numerically. Why so it's important because if you're going to do optimization with it, all of optimization is formulated on convex sets. You must be able to take you know gradient steps and make sure that the objective function makes sense between M1 and M2. And I don't know if any of that is rigorous. I don't know if there's a complete lacunas in that, in that uh, manifold. I don't even, that's why I keep putting manifold between, uh, quotes. <laughs> the, yeah, between quotes, because I don't know if there's any result that proves that these manifolds are smooth or they're like filling or they're, you know, they're smooth on convex sets or, or any such uh, things. I, I'm okay. sure Laurent knows a lot more about this than I do. What I know is that physicists know a lot more about this than mathematicians, that's for sure. <laughs> but they always do. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's true. We are, we are already a bit over the, the hour, but uh, we can take one or two more questions, maybe. If not, we can uh, thank uh, Rami again for uh, those uh, those two great talks. Thank, thank, thank you, Rami. That was great. Great to see you. I'm thank happy you could join us. Thank you. Bye, Rami. See you. Thanks. Yep. Bye-bye.